following video is brought to you by BSEN, Boston Sports Entertainment Network. Please subscribe, hit that like button, and as always, leave a comment, and thank you for enjoying the video. I got the Boston Celtics going to the final. I got a win in the world. It's time to represent your city. Put your hands up. Kyle. You know we do it for Boston. Ain't nobody gonna like Boston. Yeah, hey. Can't nobody do it like Boston. Where the legends get made, where the banners get raised, right? Life's big stage. Boston. All the fire we bring in a city full of rings. It's a beautiful thing out of Boston. And hey, you ain't hard like that. You don't put it on the line with your squad like that. That's right, Boston. All we do is win like cigars in the gym, and we at it again. I say, Bean Town, what's up? What's up? 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 Feel the energy shift. Now we jump another gym. Yeah. Represent, showing out how we ball up the rim. Larry Legend, 86, to the truth in 08. Cement your name with the all time greats. Hey. To banner 18 in the Raptors. South the green, only green that matters. It's about that time. Ain't another city that's louder than mine. Always gonna shine with the game on the line. What you think was gonna happen, man? That's how we do it in Boston. Welcome back to Dynasty Proud, episode seven, brought to you by Boston Sports Entertainment Network. My name is Jason. That's Alex. Alex, what's going on? How's it going, Jason? Good. How are you? Um, so we got we have some big news that just dropped right before we came on. LeBron and AD are out versus the Celtics tonight. That's kind of a uh, a shock considering they only come to Boston once a year. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think LeBron still has PTSD from being on his hands and knees crying last year in the garden. Um, but given that this is a TNT national game and the new rules of the NBA that you can't sit more than one person that's either been an all NBA or an all-star the last three years, it's a little surprising to see him sit both because he'll definitely get fined for it. It's not like either of them were seriously injured. They just played last game. So in a way it's kind of ducking. It's soft as Kobe would say. Um, it's disappointing from a fan aspect. I mean, you want to see, you know, the stars play. I mean, I don't think the Lakers were going to win anyways, but you want to see, you know, all the big players play. This is a marquee matchup, the Celtics Lakers. They only come here once a year. So it is disappointing from a fan aspect, but the Celtics just need to take this game seriously. You know, in the past, a lot of times, you know, stars are out. They just kind of go through the motion. So don't let that happen, but just take care of business with whoever's out there. You know, I'm surprised that they're not playing tonight in the garden. I know AD has been on the injury report with an Achilles you know, injury management type thing. LeBron, I haven't seen at all. So I am sort of surprised that both of them are sitting out, especially on the TNT game. I mean, it's, I believe it's, you know, it's one of the biggest games, I think, for the Lakers, you know, on the year. They come to Boston and play against Jason and Jalen. And it just, it sucks that as Celtics fans, we're not going to be able to see that. And I'm sure Lakers fans are disappointed at it as well. But um, yeah, it's, I, I think it's a big loss for the, for the, for the NBA in general to not see a game like that. It'll be a big loss for the Lakers, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> honestly probably but um other than that we have quite a bit to get to um a lot of good games this past week for the celtics uh probably one of the biggest ones is them going down to miami and whopping the heat 143 to 110 um it was a close game but the celtics they turned it around the third and fourth and ended up blowing out the heat obviously the heat uh had terry rosier in his second game um didn't really do too much but you can see his impact on the floor um, what are your thoughts on, on that game? So I was there sitting pretty close. So it was definitely a fun game to watch. Um, Celtic nation was out in full force that game, even from getting the bars before the game, which is all Celtic green, all jerseys. It was let's go Celtic chance the whole time. And the only time that it really got stopped, it wasn't even heat fans chanting over it or booing. It was the organ players, you know, playing music or playing sounds, the, you know, the let's go heater defense chance to try to, you know, direct that away from it but it was a fun night the Celtics I believe it was their second best shooting night in the history of the franchise um 64 percent from the field 55 percent from three you know in the first half it was a close game as you referenced but that was just because the Heat were scoring they couldn't stop us and then the second half we just continued to score and the Heat were scoring less so it was a good old-fashioned ass kicking um always fun to to win down here in Miami you know it seems like we always do win in Miami we have our problems with them in the garden but in Miami, you know, we're, we won three games in the playoffs here two years ago. We won two games here last year, including game six. 
um, and then winning this. And then we have one more game next week and Super Bowl Sunday afternoon matinee here. But it was uh, it was definitely fun. It was encouraging for the Celtics. Now, with the Heat, what are your thoughts about them? I mean, is this just par for the course? Like, you know, as many of their fan base believes that they, as long as they're in the play-in, they're just going to turn it on again. That Devil's Magic is going to repeat itself, and they're going to go on another finals run. Or is it the reality of this is just not a good team? Jimmy Butler is a year older. The surrounding pieces are just not good enough. Um, I'd like to know what your thoughts on that are. So oh, it's tough to – so part of me wants to wants to compare them to sort of like the Chiefs of what they – the Chiefs were not good during the regular season. They kind of were going on cruise control and then come playoffs. Now they're, you know, the best team ever. I, I see the heat, uh, like that aspects in the heat somewhat. You know, they, they cruise through the regular season. Jimmy Butler, you don't really hear anything from him. And then come playoff time. He turns into playoff Jimmy and he's scoring 30, going crazy, you know, eight assists here and there. And it just, you know, you kind of wonder if that's going to happen again. But at the same time, the Heat lost two valuable role players and gave Vincent and Max, Max Drews. They did get Terry. They could do something else at the deadline. We don't know. So we're kind of looking at like if sort of like maybe it's an incomplete Heat team right now. They could be different at the deadline. Maybe my opinion would change. But as, as currently constructed right now, the Heat, I am not – overly concerned about the heat and how they're playing and uh, you know especially like against the Celtics you know come playoff time I think you know if they add somebody of uh like a you know DeJounte Murray or maybe they get you know D'Angelo Russell or someone to maybe close the gap you know a little bit to maybe get some more guard play but you know as of right now I, I still I think they're they're sort of a bad team uh, but it's it's hard to say because you never know till playoff time if they're going to show up or not. So for me, everyone talks about the finals run, but a lot of people don't talk about is they were two minutes away from not even making the playoffs. They lost their first playing game to Atlanta. They were down Chicago with under three minutes left in the fourth quarter of that second play in game. You know, it's like, which team really is the heat? And if you watch them play like, yeah, everyone's like they didn't have Tyler Hero, but are they really a better team with Tyler Hero? Obviously, he's a great scorer, but he's a complete liability on defense. You can attack him. You can, you know, match up with him. You know, say switch them on to ISOs, put them on an island when he's out there. So I don't think they're good. I really don't think they're that good. Obviously, you know, you have to respect them, what they've been able to do, playoff Jimmy, um, Spolstra, you know, Bam out of bio. But I just don't see anything from this team that's going to say they're going to beat us in the playoffs. I mean, other than saying, like, oh, they're in our heads. But, you know, it went seven last year, and we beat them the year before. So this isn't like Celtics versus Philly where they've just never beaten us, you know? Every year it is a battle, and if they, if you tell me right now it's going to be Celtics Heat in the Eastern Conference Finals again, I'm not going to be shocked by it. You know, they've they've been there, they've done that, but we got to stop talking about the Heat. Like, there's some team that's a dynasty, like even the Chiefs, like that they're winning titles every year. The Heat don't win titles. Like, you know, they made it to two finals, but they weren't really that competitive in either one of them. You know, it's almost kind of um, injustice to the NBA that Gabe Vincent, you know, landed under Tatum's ankle in Game 7 because they would have won Game 7 and would have been a much better series with the with the Nuggets. I don't know if they would have beat them. We don't get a chance to find out. Maybe we will this year. But, you know, they haven't gotten over the hump, and I don't think they're good enough. So I'm sure everybody, once it comes to the end of the year and you look at the standings, like, they'll want to see where they are if they're still hanging around the plane. You know, Celtics fans, you know, because of, PTSD from our past experiences won't want to be lined up with them. And if they get into that seven, eight playing game, assuming we're the one seed, you know, everyone will be rooting hard for them in the first games, just so we don't have to face them in Milwaukee or the Knicks get them in the first round, but they really don't scare me this year. So I think, I think one of the biggest X factors for the heat is going to be if Bam Adebayo shows up or not. We saw last year in the playoffs, if he doesn't show up, if he doesn't really contribute, I mean, the Celtics take care of the heat all day, but when he turns it on and he scores 20, 25 and he grabs 10, 12 boards, that's where it becomes like a little issue because Bam, I think Bam is one of the most underrated bigs in the league. Like he doesn't really get talked about that much because he's kind of like a roller coaster type of player. Like he's not on AD's level. He's not on Joker and Bede's level. But when he can, when he turns it on, he's, you know, he can be one of the best in the league. And I just think, you know, if he was more consistent, I think that Heat team would be, you know, more of a team to like fear in a way, if, if that makes sense. Um, you know, when I look at the Celtics, you know, can KP, can Horford, and I guess I have to loop Cornette into this too, you know, in a seven game series, can they team up and try to like limit Bam's ability to affect the game? Um, you know, KP, I don't think is that type of type of dude to try to, you know, limit him. He's, you know, what KP is going to do is he's going to, you know, drag him out on the offensive side to guard the perimeter. So Tatum and Brown can sort of attack the rim, but on the offensive side for the heat, 
you know, you can't play Horford 35 minutes a night. I mean, you just can't in the playoffs. You know, somebody else is going to have to take valuable minutes and you're going to have to trust KP to be, you know, banging bodies down in the low post. Like, do you want that with his injury, you know, history and his concerns, you know? So, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to do about that. So one thing with Porzingis from watching it live, um, he looks like a missing element we didn't have last year. When they get into that zone, it looks like we would just – be lost on offense you know we'd just be forced into late you know late shot clock bad execution um bad shots and Porzingis just is such a mismatch for that team like they were throwing it into him at the top of the high key and he's just shooting over people like they're not even there like you'd have bam you know who's tall you'd have jimmy like people just right in his face and he's shooting right over them and it's like he's in an open gym by himself so i think that's just such a different element and the main reason i don't want to play the heat in the first round obviously like they battle with us is i just don't want the injury risk with playing with them. I mean, I'm going to call it like it is like the way they play. And I'm not necessarily saying they're dirty, but the way that they play, they always seem to be in everybody's landing space. Like, you know, with they injured Porzingis in this past game, the way they injured on their run to the finals last year, Giannis um, and Brunson and Tatum, and then Randall most le- recently taking a charge down 25 in the fourth quarter. So it's like, that's the type of team I don't want to play. Like I would much rather play a team like Atlanta or Chicago that, it's just not physical. Like, yeah, maybe they have more scoring options, but they're just not physical. They're not going to beat you up like that. Like, you know, if you're the one seed, you don't want to get beat up in the first round. Even if you we win that series in five games, like the physical toll it's going to take. Like, I want cruise control through the first round, possibly two rounds. Um, I don't even care about talent. Just not facing, you know, what do you call it, like tryhards, like people that are just overly aggressive. So it's like, I don't really want to face Neesmith, to be honest, early on. But... Um, yeah, I don't, from a talent standpoint, from a team aspect, I don't fear the heat. I would just like to avoid them if at all possible. No, I, I agree. <clears throat> I don't think playing the heat in the first round would be beneficial at all. I think it'd be a dog of a series and it would put wear and tear on guys. Guys would probably get banged up a little bit, like you said. And, uh, you know, if you're facing, let's hypothetically, I'm not saying this would ever happen. Like, what if you're going from like the heat, you, you, let's say you beat, you beat the heat in seven games in the first round. And then what happens if you meet a team like the Knicks? In the second round, the Knicks, I know right now, Randall, he has that shoulder dislocation, whatnot, you know, on Thanks paper, the maybe they don't, what'd you say? Thanks for the heat. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, like if you face a team, you know, like the Knicks in the second round, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to roll over easy. And if you're already banged up, it would look really bad if the Knicks stole a series from you in the second round because of the fight that you went through in the first round. So I completely agree uh, that I really don't want to see the heat until the second, you know, at most, but I'd love to see him in the third round in the conference finals. That would be ideal. So um, moving into the next topic. So the Knicks are rising, right? And the Bucks are sliding. The Bucks, obviously new coach Doc Rivers comes in. Um, you know, what are we, I'm trying to think. Cause like, do I really think that the Bucks are going to continue to slide? Probably not. I think they're going to figure out obviously new coach midway through the year. That's kind of, you know, not ideal. Uh, for them firing coach after going 30 and 13 is just kind of bizarre in my in, in in our own world but I think we we covered that last time um but what, what do you think about the Knicks and the Bucks do you think this trend is going to continue or do you think uh you know it's going to go opposite where the Bucks going to start to rise again in a couple of weeks and the Knicks are going to fall well the Bucks are finally getting to the part of their schedule that actually has like real basketball teams on it um and they're losing to ones that aren't even good like the Blazers last night the defense on that team is not a playoff level defense. Sure, you're going to have nights where Giannis and Dame are going to combine for, you know, 70, 80 points that will win you a game single handedly, but they don't have the defense over the course of a long series to be able to match someone like the Celtics. And so, honestly, that team, prior to making a big move at the deadline, and I don't really even know what they can do, they don't have any draft picks. They have like a second round pick and the contracts of like Bobby Portis and Pat Connaughton. So, if they can squeeze something out of that, God bless them. But I just don't see that team as a threat to me, like as to the Celtics, you know? Yeah, they mm-hmm. had that great win when, you know, they were sitting at home and we were playing our fifth game of seven nights off a of road back to back. But over the course of a series with equal rest, to me, that's, that's an, I don't say easy series, but it just doesn't feel like a team that can beat us. Um, that team doesn't seem well connected. You watch the end of games like last night, you know, that should have been Dame shot at the end of the game. It went to Brook Lopez, and he did hit a couple of big shots earlier, but you had Dame open, you had Giannis open. I don't think anybody would rather have Brook Lopez taking that shot over the two of them, and especially a contested three. So, I don't know. That team just doesn't seem right. Like, locker room-wise, you know, Doc Rivers, it's not really his fault. He just got there. But I don't think Doc's the savior, as pretty much every job he's had has proven. So, 
do I think they're going to slide down to like four or five? No, but they have, you know, a couple tough road trips, including the one they're on right now. By the end of next week, they could be in the three or four position. You know, the Knicks are on their heels. Cleveland's playing really well. So I don't think it's a shoe. And I think the real race is from like two to six because those teams could all, you know, flip flop with each other. I mean, Miami's a few back of that. If they got hot, they could get into that, you know, conversation as well. But from the Celtics, the East looks pretty much over as far as regular season standings and number one scene is concerned. Like, they already have a five-game lead. They can just take your business tonight. They'll be five and a half. And we're already going to be at almost 50 games. You know, even if the Celtics were to go, and I referenced this on Twitter, um, I think they're going to win 60 games is like the minimum. They're going to win. So to get to 60 wins from this point forward, that's 23 and 11, which is a much, you know, heavier pace of losses than they currently have. The Bucks, you know, given that, would have to go something like 29-5 and five to be able to pass us. Same thing with the Knicks. Like, I don't think either of those things are going to happen. So, for all intents and purposes, like, the race for the one seed is over. So, it's just prioritizing good habits, getting the right players rest, especially the last few weeks of the season where it's just cupcake after cupcake, which we finally will have earned at that point, where we can sit two to three starters a night and still win most of those games. So, we're in an advantageous position right now. Unfortunately, since Missoula coached the All-Star team last year, goes to the coach of the number two seed, which... If it's the Bucs, it's going to be Doc Rivers, who's, you know, really earned it this year. But that doesn't matter at the end of the day. Um, love where the Celtics are at. And every other team seems to have problems except for us. Yeah, that's that is true. You said a lot of good points. Um, <clears throat> I think one of them that I, you know, as we're looking at this as a whole, you know, at the as the Knicks and the Bucks as, as two separate teams, you know, I look at the Knicks. I said this, I believe, two or three episodes ago um, where we were talking about when they acquired OG Ananobi. And we were wondering if that was maybe their big, like, all-in move this year for the trade deadline. Now, after them uh, losing Randall uh, for, I think it's going to be probably, if I had to guess, probably like three, three and a half, four weeks. A dislocated shoulder. I don't think he had any damage, structurally damage inside the the shoulder, which is good news for the Knicks. Um, you know, will they make another move? I'm not sure. They do have a lot of draft assets still, and they do have some guys at the end of the bench they could look to move. Um, you know, like Trey McBride, who they just – they just signed to a long-term deal, but I wonder if that was so they're able to move money, you know, more money to, to get to get someone, um, you know, but I, I don't know. I mean, when I look at the Knicks and the Bucks as a whole, I mean, the, the Bucks they're going to have a tough time to with a new coach, new system, probably new system, uh, but Giannis is real, you know, running the team. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see a way where, you know, the Bucks can even catch us. I don't even think it's, it, it probably isn't even mathematically possible, but I do want to get your, your thoughts on, do you think Doc is going to do good, uh, do more good than harm? Or do you think he's going to, uh, you know, or is there going to be more issues that stem from, from the Bucks? Because Doc, he's, he's a veteran coach. He's not going to take any, any BS. Obviously Giannis, you know, you got to do everything to, to please Giannis. Um, do you think, you know, he's going to help this team to get to another level where maybe we haven't seen them yet this year. I mean, Doc will command respect. He is a veteran coach. He has a big name to him. He does have a ring with the 08 Celtics. He also does have a bad resume as well in the playoffs of being the coach that's won the most 3-1 leads, 3-2 leads in playoff history. So I think he's an adult in the room and he's someone that has a resume. So comparing that to Adrian Griffin, yes, I think he'll command respect and he could help the team. Is he going to make Damian Lillard not a defensive liability? Is he going to make Pat Connaughton a good defender? I don't think so. And that's really their issue at the end of the day. Like, you have two all-world players. You have, you know, at the very least, a functional coach. Like, they have pieces, but I don't think they're – I mean, they may have more issues in the locker room that we don't know about, but I don't think they have the pieces to beat the Celtics. And I can't see what that move is realistically, even if they could somehow get to Jante Murray, which I don't see how that's possible. Like, because, yeah, you can match money – with, you know, Pat and Bobby, and then send out a second-round pick. But you're telling me Atlanta can't get a better off than that. They can't even get a first-round pick out of it and two players that really do nothing for that team. So there's no move for me that makes them, a be like, a better team. Maybe they will get Matisse Thibel from Portland. That would help. But, you know, then you're sacrificing some offense that you have with Connaughton because I'm assuming he'd be in the possible yeah. Portis as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, you have two superstars. Maybe they win a game or two in a series against you just because you have those two superstars and they have their type of nights. But over a seven-game series, they don't have the defense to guard the Celtics. They didn't last year. And losing Drew Holiday, I wonder if they still do that deal if they know that Drew Holiday ends up in the Celtics. Like, yeah, you're getting the best player in the deal. You're getting Damian Lillard. So maybe they still do. But they made the Celtics better by doing that. Like, we love the KP trade for Marcus Smart. But if you don't have Drew Holiday in the back end of it, 
who's running, you know, you have Malcolm Brogdon starting this year, you know, like I think the Celtics would have a bigger hole that they were able to patch up very simply because the Bucks were able to get Damian Lillard and it created a big hole for them. So I just don't view the Bucks as a threat. As far as the Knicks, I mean, I love the way they're playing. They've been winning all these games. They have, I believe, 21-2 record against teams under 500, but they're only 10-17 and 17 or 11-17 against teams over 500. So we have to see what they can do against playoff contender type teams to see if they're going to actually win playoff series. Like, it's great they can beat up on the Wizards, on Detroit, on the Jazz. Although, you know, the Bucks and the Sixers couldn't beat up on the Jazz. But what can they do in a playoff series where, you know, it's the, t- the competition level and the talent level rises? Can they still do the, you know, do the same thing? So do they cash in all their assets now? And who are you going to go get? Because I wouldn't put Donovan Mitchell on the trading block. You know, Cleveland's right there. They're right. They could be the three or possibly two seed if things go right for them. So unless you're convinced he's not resigning and you just look at this team as like they're not going anywhere. So, yeah, it's kind of like fool's gold that what they're doing right now, they're not going to move him. So what's the big move for the Knicks to cash in all their assets? Like Carl Anthony Towns isn't getting moved. So I think for with them, they go forward with what they have. They make moves around the margins. And maybe in the offseason, if they flame out early, they can you know push more of their chips in for the big star. So you, funny you mention, uh, you know, chips in the middle of the table. There is one player – that as you were you were talking, I was thinking about you know what move the Knicks could make where maybe you know it makes sense. It maybe it you know move that puts the East on notice a little bit would be the Utah Jazz's uh, Lori Markkinen. Um, the guy's an absolute scorer, uh, an absolute baller. Uh, he's stranded on an island with a you know kind of like a discombobulated Jazz team. Some nights they show up, other nights they don't. Um, you know, he's been rumored to be thrown out there maybe, but they want to haul for him. They want like four or five first round picks. The Knicks have the assets and they have like the young players, you know, to go get them. You know, does he make sense for them? Is that the guy that they want to push everything in the middle of the table for? I, I mean, I don't know, but if they think that they're, that they need to make another huge move to, to get to, I, I don't really want to say our level, but let's say, you know, top two in the East level to be able to compete for, you know, for real, maybe that's the move they look, they look to do. Um, Going back to the bucks. I think uh, if you're going to trade Portis and Conton for, for Murray, I think that'd be a horrid trade for them Uh, because you're losing. Cause think about it. Yeah. Brooke Lopez and and Giannis are going to be your two rim protectors to start. But you know, after that, if Portis is gone and Portis plays about 25 minutes a night and, and pretty much averages almost like a double, double every time he plays, he's an absolute demon on the boards. That means you're going to force Robin Lopez, who barely plays. I think he's probably he doesn't even he doesn't even get time. He, he's like uh, he's they throw him in if the Bucks are getting blown out or they're blowing out another team. He becomes your third center and you're relying on minutes from him. I mean, I don't know if that's something that, that they'd want to do, but it makes the Bucks again more more of a you know defensively like liability than they already are to begin with. Like you said, Dame doesn't play defense. Giannis can't do everything by himself. They don't have guards that can that can actually guard. And to your point about would the Bucks have traded Drew if they knew he was going to the Celtics, I think they probably still, in theory, you're getting Dame Lillard. So when you look at it as a whole, you're getting, you know, a top three point guard in the league. He's an absolute sniper. He can drop 35 any night. But, you know, I, I think the Bucks still would be kicking themselves being like, well, we didn't value defense like we probably should have. And you can see it. They're, they're not good defensively. They don't real. They're not deep. They can't. You know, I know Andre Jackson, the kid from Connecticut, uh, UConn, has been playing some good minutes for them when guys are in and out. Um, you know, Beasley's kind of numbers of three point shooting has been dropping a little. Like I, I don't, I, I don't know what move. Like I can tell you that would make perfect sense for them, given they don't have a lot of assets left. And if you're going to trade from their roster or from their rotation. It's going to start with Portis and Connaughton. You can't – there's no other direction. Like, Andre Jackson doesn't have that much trade value yet. So, I don't know – like, I don't know off the top of my head, like, what – like, if you're going to subtract players from their roster, like, what move would would make sense? I think in the offseason, if they go home in round one or two, I could see um, Brooke Lopez being moved. I could see possibly Middleton being moved. But that's not an in-season trade that you do with this team because that changes the identity of this team. So, I just don't see them as – a real threat to us, like what they, what they have, you know, like, as I mentioned, like those two studs, like the stars that they have, they're going to win a couple of playoff games by themselves. But over the course of a series, I don't trust their defense and I don't think they have enough. And I think they're too old. So right. I just, I just don't like that team. I, I agree. So, but I, I, I want to move on and talk about something else. 
Uh, so we're going to stay in the East. We're going to talk about the 76ers. <clears throat> so last night, or I'll, I'll kind of set the stage a little bit. So Embiid has had this knee injury for, I think, the last week and a half or so. He's obviously been told by team doctors, you know, to not play. He didn't play uh, two nights ago, but he played uh, last night or not last night, the night before against the, uh, the Trailblazers, right? And he got hurt, or against the Lakers, and he got hurt. Warriors. Warriors. I was like, I was like, I knew it was somewhere in, in California, but I, I was, I was space cadet. Uh, against the Warriors, Kaminga fell on his knee. And, you know, he's pushing through it. He went to the locker room before, earlier in that game. He came back. Kaminga fell on him. He was obviously in pain. Um, he had an MRI. He ended up flying back to Philadelphia uh, for more evaluation. Uh, but the point is, there's a 65-game minimum that players have to play to be eligible for in-season awards. And on the Draymond Green podcast on the volume, he was saying that he could tell that Embiid was forcing it to play in that game when he wasn't 100% healthy to be able to – you know, not take too many games off for this NBA in-season, you know, awards. So my question to you and, and basically to everyone out there is, would you would you lower the minimum uh, or would you raise the minimum for games or would you just get rid of it, you know, completely? Because right now, I mean, Draymond was, was spot on. I mean, you don't want guys forcing it when they're truly hurt you know, if they have a chance to win like the MVP, I know Embiid already won it. So technically, I mean, he should be focused on championships, but uh, I just want to get your thoughts on, on that. The problem with it is if you, t if you lower it, what are you lowering it to? Cause at any level, if let's just say you make it 60 next year, well, that's, you know, it's only a five game difference. And then people complain about that. If you lower it to 50, I mean, at that point, it's like a gut person can miss almost half of the year and still win MVP, you know, like, at some point, you have to put your foot down on these things because especially with so much money tied to it, and I get the player's point of view. Like, you know, if they get an injury, it's not fair. But if you're missing 30 or 40 games a year, how, how can you really be the MVP? You know what I'm saying? Like, there has to be a line drawn in the sand on this stuff. Now, Embiid, really, should it be more focused on winning a championship or getting out of the second round, which he's never done? I feel like that should be the concern. He already got his, you know, like, here, stop crying MVP last year. Like, I feel like at this point, that shouldn't be a priority for him. He should be missing games because he's hurt. But the the narrative should be, you know, I just want to get myself back so I can help my team win so, you know, we can finally get past the second round and win a championship here in Philadelphia instead of like, oh, this isn't fair. You know, I can't win the MVP just because I'm only going to play 42 games this year. Like, it, it doesn't work like that, you know. So I get it. Like, if some, a guy comes in at 64 games this year, then like, yeah, maybe he has a legitimate beef. But that's still like you're only playing 75% of the games. Like, I love a job where I get 100% of my pay for playing for showing up to work 75% of the time. Like that's a job I want, but you know, you have to, you have to put your foot down at some point. Like, I don't know if there is an arbitrary number, but 65 just seems like a fair amount. Like that's still missing 17 games. Like that's a month's worth of games. You can miss every single year. I mean, for Tatum to ever miss that much in a year, it would have to be Brad, like pretty much like demanding or like locking him at home. So he can't come to the arena or a serious injury, which knock on wood, he hasn't had yet, you know? So it always seems to be a problem with these like prima donna stars, like the average player that, you know, unless they're seriously hurt, isn't missing games. Yeah. I mean, when we, when we look at the the top players that really, that really milk injuries, it's up top of my head. It's, it's, it's Embiid. It's AD. Uh, ben Simmons is up there. Ben Simmons barely plays anymore. He plays one game, his knee hurts and you don't see him for two months um, or it's his back. And uh, LeBron sometimes does it, you know, but the whole injury management, it's, it's basically like a, like an injury management thing where like, I, first of all, I want to, you know, say that I, I think Embiid is, is truly hurt. I don't think he's, I don't think he's, he's faking this, this knee stuff. Um, but you know, when you look at the 65 game thing, that is a collective uh, bargaining agreement. Like that is, you have to play at least 65 games to be considered for NBA and season rewards. Um, which again, you said 17 games, which is a month. Like that's fair. Like in my mind, that's fair, but there's a lot of players, uh, who are saying that, um, management and even ownership will come down and say, listen, you're not going to play on this random Wednesday night against Atlanta or Charlotte because, you know, you're not, you know, it's, it's, they're going to call it an easy game and they don't want to risk, risk an injury, which in fairness is, is pretty much a shot at, you know, lower level, you know, NBA teams like Charlotte, Atlanta, Utah, like that big players, you know, they take the night off in their city 
because they don't want to get hurt playing in a game that their team's probably going to win by 35. Um, but in a whole, you know, 65 games doesn't doesn't bother me to for that to be the threshold. Um, but a thing that Draymond Green said is I think he said he lost out on like defensive play in the year when Kawhi only played 41 games that season. It was only a couple of seasons ago because this collective uh, bargaining agreement is new and this is the new number, 65. So it's um, – it's interesting for sure, but I, I don't understand why players are so, like, upset about it. So it's like both sides of the coin, you know. It's like they're complaining, like, oh, I have to play 65 games to win awards. But then they're also mad, oh, why did this guy only play 41 games and get this award over me? So it's like you can't have it both ways, you know. And I think with Embiid, I agree. I think he's legitimately hurt. He's always hurt. I think the problem is his style of play. When you're that big and you're flailing yourself down to the ground on every play to try to draw a call, eventually, you know, that adds up. And that's why in a playoff series, I will never fear him. It doesn't matter how many points he scores. Horford's going to be on him. He's going to make him work. He's going to make him fall down all game long and tire himself out and kind of bruise him up. So when it comes to the fourth quarter, he's so gassed that he doesn't even have the stamina to be able to get up and down the court. He's not demanding the ball. He's not, he has no legs for jump shots anymore. So that's the style of play with him. And until he's going to, he can correct that, which at this point in his career, he's already 30. Like, I don't really know what he can do to change that about his game. Cause if he takes that away, if he stops falling and trying to foul bait the whole time, he's going to score 10 points less a game. And then he won't even be in these MVP conversations. So it, it, he's kind of made his bet. He's got to lay in it. That's my thoughts on it. Um, if you want to talk about Philly though, as a whole, they suck without him when he's not on the floor. I think they've, they haven't even won 10 games in the games he hasn't played. So <clears> I think Philly, if he's actually out for a period of time, and I think the minimum with what this is, minimum is like two to four weeks. It could be much worse. We're waiting for the MRI to come out. But the fact they don't even have the MRI done yet means the swelling was so bad they couldn't even do it. Yep. I'm looking at a month as a minimum. Philly could really fall right now. They're already in fifth. Like, yeah. you, know, you take a month of no not having Embiid, they, I mean, they could end up possibly in the play-in if Miami yep. can turn it around. Like, I mean, that's amazing how quickly they can fall. And then Embiid, it's like, if he's really, really hurt, their season could be done. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you look, when you look at the 76ers roster, if Embiid doesn't play, you're relying on Tobias Harris and Tyrese Maxey to be your your A and B like players to take you where you want to be. Now, listen, Maxey's a great player. He's going to be a great player in this league. I said this, I believe, on the first episode. When Embiid does not play, he becomes a shell of himself. And Maxey doesn't. And Pat Bev said it on his podcast too. And he told Max, he was like, he was like, listen, Embiid plays. You're, you know, you're unbelievable when he doesn't play you don't show up. And I think that's exactly like what happens now. Obviously Max, he hasn't been playing the last couple of games. He's had, a, he's had a knee issue himself. Um, and he hasn't been playing, but when you look at the roster, like, you know, Nicholas Batum is starting, you know, he, he's not, he, he's no threat. Uh, Kelly Oubre, who supposedly didn't get hit by a car, but did he's the, he, he's also supposed to be playing as well. And he doesn't really do as well, you know, either. Um, and their bench isn't like anything that I'm like worried about. Like, you know, you get Pat Bev coming off the bench. Um, you know, I just, I don't know. This team is not deep. They got to make a move at the trade deadline. If Embiid is out for any extended period of time, Daryl Morey has to figure out how to get better. And a move that I think, I don't know the cap, the cap, someone would have to go, but is there a world that Joel Embiid and I know I know this guy won't get traded because this team I believe is second or third even first in the West but I you know we're gonna just play the imaginary game could you see a world where a cat and Joel Embiid can coexist on the court at the same time you remember when they were like wrestling on the ground fighting each other a couple years back um (laughs) now obviously Minnesota is not making that trade because at least right now because right now they're not messing with what they have. You know, they've overachieved. They're either first or second. I believe they're in the first seat right now. Um, I mean, I guess just because Embiid doesn't play all the time. So, yeah. you know, Cat will have his nights to shine. But, like, the Twin Tower thing, I mean, they, they're not traditional centers. So, sure, they both space the floor. I mean, Cat's a dog shit defender. Let's call it what it is. Embiid yeah. is a good rim protector, but he's slow. So, yeah. it's... I don't think that's the piece for them. I can see that being the piece for like the Knicks, but I I think for them, what they could really use is someone like a Jimmy Butler, who's despite what Perkins says, despite everything Perkins says, but um, I think he's not getting moved. Obviously. I mean, even the heat going into a further tailspin, I don't think they're going to trade him at least not during the season, but during the off season, like someone like that, they need like a wing. They could use like, they need like a big wing, like a score. Like they're not getting Tatum obviously, but someone like that, like 
a guy, a two-way player that's like a scoring wing, even a Zach Levine. I mean, maybe he just needs a change of scenery, and they could probably get him for next to nothing. But it's like, is he really helping you that much over Tobias Harris? Because money-wise, Tobias would have to go to get him. You know, they need a scoring wing. Like, they have the guard and Maxi. They have the Embiid. They kind of have the big and the guard. They need the wing. So that's the type of player that they need. I just don't know who's available they can get, especially this season that'll make a difference. And if Embiid isn't there, it doesn't make a difference anyways. Do you think they should have been on OG and an OB then if they if they need a wing that badly? I mean, I don't think OG is the type of wing that they needed. They need someone that's, like I guess, more of an offensive punch than OG. I think OG is perfect where he's at right now. Yeah. I think the Knicks are becoming more and more of a threat. Um, I don't think they can beat the Celtics, and I don't see the move that puts them in. And I honestly think this Celtic, like this past week, you just feel so great about where the Celtics are at. They're the only team that really doesn't need to make a move, but that doesn't mean Brad's going to sit on his hands. Yeah, um, yeah. As we talk about almost daily, I would love Lonnie Walker. Give me Lonnie Walker off the bench. Um, I think <laughs> that pencils Lonnie Walker, Sadiq Bay, give me the two of them, and uh, I can start booking my flight for June to Boston. Yeah, but, that would, uh, yeah, yeah I mean, the team just looks great right now. No, I was going to say that was uh, – I mean, that's like a dream scenario um, if we get the both of them. I just – I Celtics are making moves. I don't know. I'm still – I'm going to save that that for next week because I know we did a lot about that uh, uh, last week. But, um, you know, getting back to, to the Sixers, I don't know. I honestly – I don't know what move they're going to make. I don't know what makes sense for them in the, uh, in the long term and the short term because, you know, if they want to compete this year, they got to do something. Tobias Harris, you cannot rely on him. Kelly Oubre, you cannot rely on him at all. Um, but I do want to move to kind of the road ahead and where, you know, what, you know, obviously we, we got smarts return coming up, even though he's not going to be playing, he still has that, uh, broken finger that I believe it is dislocated, broken finger. Uh, he's going to be out to the end of the month, which sucks. It would have been nice to see smart play in Boston. And then we were supposed to get Braun and AD tonight, but, uh, they're probably back in LA. Well, they're probably going to be here, but they're not playing tonight, which, makes tonight sort of like a eh game um you know do you, do you expect any any challenge tonight probably d'angelo russell and austin reeves master class coming our way i think if we take it seriously then there shouldn't be a challenge the celtics of the past lose these games or these are like nail biters because they show up and they're like oh well the stars aren't playing you know i'm just gonna jack up threes is isolation basketball if they play the way that they should play this should be an easy win the next four games honestly at home of this homestand should be easy wins and Take advantage of when you can. The East already looks like it's ours. Like, just keep putting your foot on the gas. You know, take them out of the game early. You know, so then you can start resting guys. Um, Grizzlies, same thing. I mean, that first game in in uh, in Memphis was a dogfight to the very very end. That didn't need to didn't need to happen. You know, yeah. so I mean, it'll be nice to see Smart. I know they're going to do the video tribute. Smart already said he's going to be in Boston for it. So, I think this will probably be like. I'm, like I'll say definitely emotional for smart. I think the people, there's a, a love between the city of Boston Celtics fans and Marcus smart. I think also the fact that it's, you know, not going well for him and we've just elevated like to another level with Cor- Porzingis. And it was clear that was trade was necessary and it was a victory for us. It takes some of the sting away from it. Now, like let's just say right now we're floundering around like the three or four seed and Memphis is like a top team with smart maybe there's different type of reaction to this. Smart was always going to get love, but it's always kind of like, damn, like, I can't believe we did that. Like, now it's like, love Smart. Would love to see him come back to the Celtics someday, but that was the move I think needed to be made. Porzingis is a game changer for us. You know, thank you for everything, Marcus. You know, give you an ovation. We'll hopefully, you know, beat the crap out of the Grizzlies that night. I, uh, it sucks, man. I, I wish the Celtics could have pulled that out, you know, you know, to win against the Golden State Warriors. Uh, you know, Marcus was a... You know, he really represented, I think, what Boston's all about, you know, hard work, you know, putting the work in, showing up every day, doing your job. And he did that. I just think at the end of the day, you know, good things always come to an end at some point. And, um, you know, when you have a chance to get a guy like Porzingis uh, to make your lineup more dynamic and more harder to prepare for and to guard, I think you you do that move all day. Um, and it sucks that Memphis is kind of falling apart. I know Ja torn labrum out for the year. Desmond Bain has an ankle sprain. You know, they, they're kind of falling. They're kind of falling apart a little bit. It seems like a lost year in Memphis. Um, I will say, I guess I, you never want to, you know, wish any injuries on anybody, but it, it is good that Marcus has that broken finger so he can't go and help the Bucks Cause that would have been a move that it's a Drew holiday type of move, right? Obviously, Drew's probably an all-around better defender, maybe in some categories. 
But if they if the Bucks got a guy like Marcus, we've talked about this before. You never know what what could happen. Marcus would, if you put Marcus in a series against Boston, you know he would he would do everything in his power to make sure we lost. So with Marcus Smart, I mean, it's not like this is a season ending injury. In theory, they could still trade for him. The the direction the Grizzlies have to decide is like. You know, this season's a wash for them. They're going to be a lottery team, get a high draft pick. But when you return next year, you know, is Marcus Smart part of their future? He's got a good contract. They still have him for two more years. They don't need to trade him. He's not in a contract year. So what are the Bucks giving them that makes them trade Marcus Smart uh, and give up the future of the team with Marcus Smart on it that, like, makes sense for them? There's no blue chip prospect. There's not going to be a high draft pick. There's not even going to be a first round pick in that deal. So it's like, what does Bobby Portis and Pat Connaughton do for them to give them Marcus Smart and it deteriorates their team for next year? So I don't think there's any move to be made for Marcus Smart. If, like, if, if Milwaukee had a couple first and they're just like, you know, F it, let's just go yeah. add Marcus Smart, you know, yes. get him, need him against Boston. We need to improve our defense. Like, we need to, like, we'll trade these first because we can win the championship this year. They don't have first, they don't have a blue chip prospect, they don't have anything to trade for somebody like Marcus Smart. So, I mean, you never say never, but I can't see him being moved at the deadline. So, so that'll be good for us. I mean, the only way he goes to Milwaukee is if Memphis, like their front office, just doesn't understand how trades work. Because the only player on Milwaukee's roster that would be young enough to be able to fit in their timeline would be Andre Jackson Jr., who the kid out of Connecticut, who I believe is a rookie. Uh, you know, maybe if they're high on him, maybe they, they like him and they really want him. But you'd still have to add – Connaughton or Portis in that deal uh, for Marcus. And I don't even really know if that even gets it done. I'm just, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate. You know, if I'm Memphis and I'm, you know, if I really want to get rid of Marcus smart and that's like the best thing I got, maybe, maybe they do that. Or, you know, I'm sure Memphis doesn't have any vendettas against us. Like why would they want, you know, you know, you know, Bucks go to Memphis and be like, yeah, we want Mark smart to, to beat the Celtics and Memphis. Goes, oh, yeah, okay. Miami and Philly could put together better trade packages if they wanted Smart since they have first-round picks. And in theory, they have more intriguing young talent. So it's not that Smart couldn't be moved. He's just not being moved to the Bucks. So yeah. they need to figure out something else. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't I, – well, I guess we'll see. We'll see We'll see if he gets moved, if he, if he doesn't. But uh, I, the trade deadline next week should be, uh, you know, very, very surprising because I know there's going to be a lot of uh, action. So one more thing that I want to get to is the All-Star Reserves – come out tonight um i can already tell uh that there's going to be some surprising uh players uh is there anything that you're looking forward to seeing who's selected i think the celtics deserve at the minimum three all-stars obviously tatum's gonna be an all-star starter everybody knows jalen brown's making the team can we get that third piece could we get four um i think porzingis and Derek white should both make it reggie miller has been like the leader of along with jj reddick of the Derek white is an all-star campaign he can't stop talking about it so i'm almost like what does he know um, I actually think it's going to be harder for White to make it than for Porzingis, especially now with the Embiid injury, with the Randall injury. You know, there's going to have to be another forward added. I think that's where Porzingis could slide in, could give him an advantage here. I think White is definitely deserving, but the fact they already gave Dame the all-star starter spot, um, you're going to have Maxi there, you're going to have Brunson there, um, they're going to have Donovan Mitchell there. So it's like, it's, it's going to be hard for him to make it, but I think the Celtics being the clear best team in the NBA and by far in the East, deserve it the minimum a third all-star um is it bad that i don't want porzingis anywhere near the all-star game bro it depends i don't want how play. hard they're playing i don't want to make i don't bro i he who doc rivers is gonna make him play like 40 minutes a night in that game and i just i can't i know if he's not that's not actually gonna happen but i listen if he makes the all-star great but like Take anybody but Porzingis, because like if Porzingis rolls his ankle, if he bangs bodies with Giannis or uh, whoever on by accident, like I don't need him getting hurt or you know he always out four to six weeks with a fractured finger, like none of that, because you know it's you know, especially with him, that it could happen. And I just listen, take Drew, take Jalen, take White, take Tatum, because they you know they're less injury prone. KP can sit this one out. Send him home, you know, on the beach, couple days, margaritas, you know, lounging off his feet. That's the best case scenario. No, I agree. And the good thing is that the Sixers aren't going to be in a position for the second best record because Nick Nurse would run him to the ground like he did Kemba. Um, <laughs> if he does make it, it'd be a great recognition. I think it's deserved, even though he hasn't played a ton of games this year. He's been an all-star level player. 
Um, if he does play, you know, hopefully it's in a reserve role. He comes in for five minutes, just jacks up a few 30 foot step back threes. And that's the extent of his uh, all-star highlights. I think white has a better chance of making it just because there's been such a big campaign from the Celtics from, you know, like analysts for him to make it. So I think that's the one that I really, really want. I think the Celtics get a third. I'm not sure who it is, but I could also see them just getting Tatum and Brown. And to me, that'd be a little aggravating considering the Bucks got two starters and the Celtics that are clear cut the best team in the NBA, and especially in the Eastern Conference, to only get two as well. I think they deserve a third, whoever it may be. Um, but I get your point, and I definitely agree with that. Send them down here to Miami, you know, go lounge out at the pool with some margaritas and uh, rest up for the second half. Yeah, exactly. You don't want – just keep him off his feet. I like, I, like I've said before, Brad, if you want to make up every injury management rule – you know, his quads bothering him, you know, his toe is sore, whatever you can do to get him to the playoffs 100% healthy, I'm for. Um, you know, but I, but I think that does it today for, for today's episode. Um, you guys can watch this on Twitter at DynastyProud18. It will be posted. There will be a link. And then you can watch it on YouTube at BSEN underscore 617. Alex, I, I think we have – you know, a great couple of days to look forward to. And uh, the trade deadline should be fun. It's an exciting time of year. Um, love where the Celtics are at. I'd love one more piece of the deadline. We'll touch on that next week. So signing off for me and Jason, go Celtics. Have a great weekend. See ya.